Hello again, friends. Upon popular request, we're going to do another podcast on the mess and mayhem occurring in the Middle East due largely to this ultra-conservative, insane clown posse Islamic extremist group named ISIS, or ISIL, or just IS, standing for Islamic State, the territory that this radical group is trying to carve out of the current states of Syria and Iraq. Uh, we've already done a couple podcasts on this with Iraq is a wreck, parts one and two, talking about the disintegration of Iraq, thanks largely to this IS uh, insane clown posse. But today we're actually going to move next door to Syria because the whole world's attention has now been on a particular town in Syria called Kobani. And this particular town in Syria called Kobani is right on the border with Turkey, literally a stone's throw away from the Turkish border. Literally, people in Turkey are watching this town right now as the town has been under siege for months by the Islamic State group. And who is defending this town from the onslaught of the insane clown Islamic posse? Uh, a group of Syrian Kurds. Hmm, okay, that's interesting. And what's happening right now, October 29th, 2014, is that a group of maybe 75, maybe 100 Iraqi Kurds from northern Iraq, from the Kurdistan in northern Iraq, 100 Iraqi Kurds are being flown in via Turkey to help the Syrian Kurds defend this town of Kobani. How fascinating is that? And why has it been capturing the world's attention? Well, for some reason, the world thinks that this is a critical town that is so close to Turkey, right there on the Turkish border, that it's a big deal that if, if this Islamic State captures this particular town, they're going to take over all of northern Syria, and that's a big deal to Turkey. It's a big deal to the entire region. It's a big enough deal for the United States that the U.S. has gotten involved and has now been flying in food and supplies and medical supplies and probably ammunition into Kobani in order to help the Syrian Kurds defending the place from the onslaught of IS, and the U.S. has brokered the deal to get the Iraqi Kurds to come in and help, and all, all this is happening, the whole world's paying attention, it's a total mess that's caused 200 or 300,000 people to be displaced. What has Turkey been doing? Nothing. Ah, thus the podcast for today. Why is Turkey doing nothing? It actually had to be coerced by the United States to even allow the Ir Iraqi Peshmerga, that's the uh, Kurds, uh, to come through Turkish territory to go help defend this town of Kobani. Right on the Turkish border, Turkey's doing nothing. Ha! Let's call this podcast uh, uh, the Kurdish Conundrum, especially for Turkey. Okay, uh, that's a lot to tackle, but we'll do our best. Now, the world has been paying attention to this town of Kobani, again, for weeks slash months. Maybe you've heard reference to it already. Because it is one of the uh, several, maybe four, different kind of enclaves or territories or cantons, if you like, of northern Syria that have been successfully defended and are controlled by Syrian Kurds. And here's a map that shows some of those little areas up there. Again, these are Syrian Kurds who are, have taken control of these areas, largely thanks to the complete debacle and chaos caused by the three-and-a-half-year-old Syrian civil war. So the whole state of Syria is in a semi-state of chaos, and, and it's devolved to who whatever local fighting force can hold the area basically has it. And here are the ones that the Syrian Kurds uh, have been defending. And again... Kobani is that one right there, kind of central, uh, north central Syria, uh, just a few hundred, I don't know, half a mile maybe, maybe just a few hundred miles from the Turkish border. And over the course of the last several months, the IS group has decided that this is a critical place that they want to take over. They, of course, want to take over all of Syria and Iraq. That's their stated goal. And the Levant, the greater, wider Middle East area, and possibly the world. But they have focused on this place, and these local Syrian Kurds have put up quite the fight, uh, radically outnumbered, radically outgunned. The IS has 
billions of dollars to play with and maybe 20 or 30 or 40,000 fighting uh, a strong fighting force with tanks and weaponry and the whole nine yards. So this uh, Assyrian Kurd group has been vastly outgunned but has somehow held on. And again, it's caught the attention of the United States who has said, hey, we would like uh, the IS people to not win. Uh, nobody in the greater Middle East wants this IS group to win. Uh, no state, none of them, not Iraq, not Syria, not Saudi Arabia, not Turkey, no one wants to see this IS group keep gaining ground. So this battle against Kobani, which again started months ago, that and here's just some, some lines of advance that the IS has started to enclose this uh, uh, canton that the uh, Syrian Kurds controlled and has been closing in on the city basically to try to consolidate you know, their entire control over northern Syria. Uh, and the uh, Syrian Kurds have somehow, against all odds, held on. And th this is one of the reasons, BTW, that the United States started a bombing campaign. Uh, the IS threatening to take over Baghdad and other major Iraqi cities, but also the IS threatening to take over this town of Kobani is the major a catalyst that got the U.S. to act. And the U.S. now, for what, a month, two months, has been conducting an air bombing campaign. If the United States from the air can see, you know, uh, groups of IS troops or IS tanks, yes, the IS has tanks, or any sort of weaponry, anything big enough that we can put a crosshair on, the United States has been bombing in an effort to stymie their advance. And that U.S. bombing campaign has stymied the advance of IS in both countries, but only slightly, and quite frankly, it's just been a holding pattern. So point number one you should probably take home, the U.S. has been bombing the sweet bejesus out of uh, the IS in terms of any equipment or, or groups we can find, but it has only slowed their movement. It has not stopped it, and they have not retreated. The IS has not lost any ground due to the U.S. bombing campaign which is one of the reasons already we're like, oh, somebody's going to have to put some boots on the ground. The United States doesn't want to put boots on the ground, and if you don't know what that means, it means send in your troops, uh, because this is now turning into an urban guerrilla campaign, and you can't bomb whole cities out of existence. You have to go door to door and kill the bad guys, and the bad guys are going door to door to kill the good guys right now, which is another reason why the Kobani situation is in the world spotlight, is because of the, the slow motion siege, and this is really an old school medieval style siege of a city, uh, this uh, slow motion siege has allowed people to watch it happen. And what you've had over the course of the last weeks and months is uh, uh, 200 to 250,000 uh, folks from the greater uh, Kobani area, the city itself, but also the countryside, as the IS has advanced and enclosed uh, around the town, uh, 200 to 250,000 uh, people have left because they don't want to uh, die by being butchered by these, again, radical, insane uh, IS folks who want to kill anyone who doesn't agree with them, kill uh, uh, any uh, religious folks who aren't their religion. And by the way, they'll kill Christians, they'll kill Jews, but they'll, they'll kill Shia uh, Muslims, but they'll kill Sun uh, Sunni Muslims who don't agree with their particular brand of radicalism. So people are like getting the heck out of Dodge in order to not be under the, the uh, uh, leadership of the insane clown posse. So 200 to 250,000 people fled from Kobani, mostly into Turkey. Uh, and this is on top of the three and a half year Syrian civil war in which maybe two to three million people have been displaced, uh, that is, have left the uh, state of Syria. Uh, and you're looking at maybe five to six million people who have been displaced externally and internally, meaning you got five to six million people that would be refugee status in Syria maybe half of which have actually completely left the country. The other half are st still stuck in the country, but they've had to move away from uh, their hometown or wherever they lived at. So again, this is the cauldron of this mess that's going on here. But let's get back to the, the Kurdish conundrum. Why isn't Turkey helping out here? That's the question that the United States has been asking, that NATO's been asking. And everybody's like, what? But Turkey, you're right next door. And Turkey is a NATO member. Uh, Turkey has a modern military. Turkey's a seriously significant fighting force, and it's right there. How come the Turks haven't sent over some folks to help beat back this IS advance in Syria? Because, by the way, point three, 
Turkey doesn't like the Syrian government. Turkey, from the get-go of the Syrian civil war, has said openly the, the government of uh, Prime Minister, now President, Recep Erdogan, has said openly for years, we hate Bashar al-Assad, we hate the current government of Syria, we think they're butchers, we don't like them, we think they should be overthrown. So, by all indications, everything politically and militarily and, and tactically that you can think of would suggest that Turkey would be leading the way here uh, in this helping the Syrian Kurds push back the advance of IS. Well, fourth point, Turkey has no interest in IS winning either. And that's what I want you to learn. Here's Turkey's position. This is the general thing, and we'll come back to it at the end. Turkey's playing the long game here. What, a, what, a, what does the professor mean by that? Turkey does not like uh, the Syrian regime of Bashar al-Assad. Uh, Turkey does not like uh, IS. Turkey doesn't like any of this mess going on. Turkey has the power to stop some of this mess but going, from going on, but Turkey's not going to because they're playing the long game here. And what I mean by that is Turkey, and you could quote me on this uh, because I'm quoting some uh, uh, government ministers who have said it, Turkey actually sees the threat the, uh, of a strong Kurdistan, a strong possible Kurdistan, as much more of a long-term threat than IS. Let me sum that up again. Turkey's looking at all this mess and saying, IS people, they're insane and bad. Uh, Syrian regime, insane and bad, we hate them too. Kurds, not insane, nor necessarily bad, but we fear them more than the previous two I just mentioned. What? 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 <laughs> yes, and that's what I mean by the Kurdish conundrum. Because Turkey has a significant uh, population of Kurds in their borders, and Turkey has a long protracted, not so nice history with the Kurds, specifically in the last 100 years. It's funny that it's exactly 100 years. 100 years ago, uh, uh, during World War I, is when the Kurds thought they were going to have an independent state. And it was going to be carved out of parts of what's now Turkey. Uh, and then they didn't get it, and, but there's still a bunch of them there. Okay, maybe I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me back up, back up one more time here. Who are these Kurds that the Turks perhaps fear more than the Islamic State? Try to keep this in mind. Uh, Kurds is an ethnicity, not a religion. Most of the Kurds are Sunni uh, Muslim, by the way. So it's an ethnicity much the way that uh, Arabs are an ethnicity from the Arabian Peninsula. Most people in Saudi Arabia are Arab. Most Kuwaitis are Arab. Most Egyptians are Arab. Okay. Most people in Turkey are Turks. That's a different ethnicity. Most people in Iran are Persians. That's a different ethnicity. Yeah, see where we're going here? And the Kurds are a different ethnicity, except they don't got no state. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a map of Kurdistan. If you've ever taken my class or know anything uh, about Kurds, you've probably seen a map like this. That this is a group of people, a nation of people, uh, without a state. And it is a nation of people that are scattered across the mountainous areas of uh, 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 southeastern Turkey, uh, Iran, northern Iraq, and now you see also uh, Syria in parts of northern and northeastern Syria. That's where a whole bunch of ethnically Kurds are. Now, again, who are these Kurds? It's an ethnicity that, and a group that has a historic identity, a self-identity as people that are different from the people around them, much the way the Arabs do, much the way the Turks do. And I think they were first identified and written about, you know, like a thousand years ago. They'd be like, oh, well, there's folks over here, they're Persians, and there's folks up there in the Ottoman Empire, they're Turks. And then there's this other ethnic group uh, uh, called the Kurds that hang out uh, in this area somewhere in between. Uh, certainly by 11th century and 12th century, they're referenced in literature all over the place. They are, again, mostly uh, Islamic, mostly uh, Sunni uh, brand Islam. And uh, uh, they have a, their whole history and tradition. They have their own language. So everything that you think of when you think of, you know, even like Italians or the Spanish or the English, uh, they're their own nation, a true nation, self-identified, have a self-identity, have their own history, but they never had a state, okay? 
And the reason that it's problematic for Turkey in particular, and maybe all these other states, is that uh, for a long time, maybe for a thousand years, many of these Kurds have wanted to have their own state. And uh, off and on again, for the last thousand years, some of these Kurds have fought to have their own state. And just to give you a sense of the numbers, and these are fuzzy numbers, because we're not even sure. I checked probably 10 different sources, and no one can even agree on the numbers of how many Kurds there are. But just to put you in the ballpark, estimated, estimated 28 to 32 million. We're not talking about a small enclave here. 28 to 32 million people? Uh, that's a lot of folks. Uh, they, you know, there are sovereign states that don't have that many people. Australia doesn't have that many people. So you're looking at 28 to 32 million folks in and around the mountainous areas in these states. And just to roughly break it down for you, for perhaps 14 to 20 million of them are in Turkey. 14 to 20 million in, in Turkey? Yes, already uh, a red flag should be popping up in your head of why Turkey's so concerned about the Kurds. Uh, Iran probably has about 5 to 6 million. Iraq has about 5 to 6 million. And Syria, about 2 to 3 million. And again, why am I being so fuzzy with these numbers? Why don't I give you exact numbers? Because nobody knows! Because no one's done a census up in the hills of Kurdistan for the last thousand years. We don't know. The ones that have gotten the most press and are the most famous are the ones in northern Iraq. Ah, that might bring us back to the current story. The Kurds in northern Iraq are the ones that I believe, and I've already predicted, are finally going to realize the Kurdish dream of an independent Kurdistan. And that's because they're well-placed to do it as Iraq crumbles. Because as you may have heard, in Iraq is a wreck parts one and two, the Kurds are the only fighting group that had enough self-identity uh, and, and enough gumption and enough military training to want to defend their homeland when this whack-ass crazy IS group started to take over everything back in May and June and July of 2014. So while Iraq while the Iraqi army disintegrated under the threat of the IS, the Kurds held it together. And right now, uh, Kurdistan... Recall, if you hear reference to Kurdistan, it's not that big area that's crossing four states that I've shown you. Specifically anymore, when they say Kurdistan, we're talking about just northern Iraq. So that section of Iraq that the Kurds hold, they control it. They have their own government. Uh, they actually have uh, significant oil reserves up there. They have an economy. Uh, they, they might have been in battle off and on for the last 30 years, especially under Saddam Hussein's regime. But keep this in mind. It has major cities, uh, some of them quite cosmopolitan. This isn't like a, a group of folks hanging out in the mountains in tents, all right? Th th this is a civilization by all rights that has major metropolitan areas. And the Kurds in northern Iraq, Kurdistan, uh, are the only ones that have made, been able to defend themselves against the threat of IS and hold it together. The United States, for uh, the U.S.'s part, was like, great! Uh, uh, the Iraqi army's falling apart, but the Kurds are keeping it together. Let's supply them. Let's support them. Let's help them out. They're going to help hold Iraq together. I don't think so. I think that is a false assumption. I think the empowerment of the Kurds up in uh, northern Iraq is giving them every incentive to form their own sovereign state. Uh, because uh, many of them have already wanted it, and the more empowered they get, the more it becomes a realization that they can indeed do it. And at this point, why are the, the uh, Kurds in Northern Iraq even pretending to be part of Iraq? Iraq is falling apart. Ha! That's what Turkey thinks, too. Now let's bring it back to why Turkey is much more afraid of the Kurds than they are of IS. Because I've now told you that uh, uh, Turkey and we're talking about the uh, southeastern quadrant of Turkey, uh, may be home to 14, 15, 20 million people who identify themselves as ethnically Kurd. And they want to uh, speak their own language and have their own culture and maybe possibly have their own state. And Turkey has had a pretty overall bad relationship with these folks that are calling themselves Kurds for the last hundred years. Because, and now I get into the history. Bring that history back off the back burner. Uh, Turkey, uh, during its heyday, was called the Ottoman Empire. And the Ottoman Empire controlled all of this uh, greater Middle Eastern area. Here's a map of the greater Ottoman Empire. And the Ottoman Empire, unfortunately, sided up with Germany during World War I. 
and Germany lost World War I. Therefore, the Ottoman Empire also lost World War I. And it was in the aftermath of World War I where the Ottoman Empire gets carved up into a bunch of different sovereign states that you see in today's Middle East. Indeed, it was the victorious Allied powers, mostly the Frenchies and the British, who went in after they took oh, after the Ottoman Empire lost, they went in and carved up the whole Ottoman Empire and actually drew the lines that are today's Middle Eastern states. It's part of the reason why the place is such a damn mess right now in the 21st century. These are artificial borders that were drawn by uh, uh, victorious European powers a hundred years ago with no real thought to ethnic lines, linguistic lines, kingdoms, tribal affiliations, none of that. The, by the way, the Europeans did that in Africa too, which is a big problem down in the greater uh, African continent. But back to this place. You should know, put it in there, that during this aftermath of World War I, the Kurds in the mountains, in the Middle East, uh, petitioned to have their own state, and it was taken under advisement by the uh, Allied powers who said, yeah, sure, why not? Well, well you know, we're drawing these lines. Eh, here's their... Here's Jordan, and here's the Israel, and uh, well, we, we, maybe, yeah, maybe we'll draw Kurdistan. And the Kurds, at that point, 100 years ago, thought that they were going to get their own state. And then that deal kind of fell through, and the, uh, the British drew the map of Iraq, and Jordan, and Syria. I should blame the French, too. So they essentially split up the Iraq, the Kurdish population into these states that I've now outlined. And it's like, oh. So ever since then, a lot of Kurds have said, well, wait a minute, we've been promised this for a long time. And I won't go into all the historic details because that'll be another whole lecture. But on again, off again for the last hundred years, the Kurds have been screwed by way more people than the French and the British. Uh, the United States at different times has played the Kurd card to get Kurds to support a U.S. endeavor maybe against Iran, maybe against Saddam Hussein's Iraq, and said, yeah, yeah, we'll help you get a state. Nah, oh, oh you already finished doing what we wanted you to do? Yeah, never mind, we're not going to help you get a state. Uh, and, and I'm not just picking on the U.S. Other states with foreign powers, and the Russians probably, other entities, have historically used the Kurds for whatever political or foreign policy ambitions that they had, and then everybody just kind of walks away and says, well, yeah, we can't really help you form a Kurdistan. Uh, and the Turks, for their part, don't want to see a Kurdistan because they have 14 to 20 million of these folks in their country that ever since the dissolution of the Ottoman Empire, uh, the remnants of which are Turkey, Turkey has fought really hard to maintain its borders. And Turkey lost a whole bunch of area. It used to be the Ottoman Empire, then it got reduced to Turkey. And they had to fight really hard just to hold on to that. So Turkey's not interested in losing any more of its territory. It wasn't 100 years ago. It's not today. So they may look at this and say, well, there's 15 million people who are Kurds in our southeast quadrant, but we're not going to let them go and be a sovereign state. We've already lost enough territory. Is this starting to make sense already? Now, if you just left it at that, that'd be enough. That would probably be enough uh, reason for most sovereign states to say, no, we're not going to support the strengthening of the Kurds because they might rip away part of our territory to form an independent state. And that would be very good reason to not support the Kurds. But it's even deeper when it comes to Turkey because of the size of the population of Kurds within Turkey over the last hundred years. Turkey's had more problems than any other states that have uh, minorities of ethnic Kurds in them. Meaning Syria, Iran, Iraq. Yes, they've had some issues with Kurds, but not as not nearly as many as Turkey. And what I mean by that is that there has, over time, evolved out, uh, specifically in the last 30 to 40 years, uh, full-on what we call terrorist organizations, Kurdish terrorist organization. And the main one for you know is the PKK, the Kurdistan Workers Party, the PKK. Yes, I don't know. I know that uh, acronym doesn't exactly stand for the Kurdistan Workers Party, but it, in their language, it translates to PKK. Uh, the PKK has actually renamed itself a couple different times in the last five to ten years, but it doesn't matter to me. Everybody still refers to them to the PKK. And this is a group uh, that has said, yes, uh, we want an independent Kurdistan. Uh, and we want it in parts of Turkey, and we want it in parts of northern Iraq, and we want it in parts of Syria, and we're going to fight for it. In the last hundred years of Turkish history, there have been 
Kurdish political parties and sometimes Kurdish political representation in the Turkish parliament. Uh, but this PKK group, I think back in the 70s and 80s, said it's not enough. It's not moving fast enough. We're not getting, we're, we, Kurds don't have enough rights in Turkey. Uh, we don't have enough autonomy and we, or maybe we want our own area. So we're going to start blowing crap up in order to make our political point. And you had for periods of time in Turkish history, uh, uh, and I'll name some dates, from 1925 to 1965, Turkey actually closed down its whole southeastern quadrant uh, to visitation or tourist or even internal movement uh, and called it a military area. They said, no, nope, there's too much activity. There's radical groups here, and so no foreigners can't even visit this area. Uh, Turkey actually at one point, and I don't know the dates, but probably the same, probably up until the 1960s, uh, uh, outlawed the use of the Kurdish language. So they said, no, you can't teach Kurdish language in schools in southeastern Turkey. No, we, we don't care if you're ethnically uh, Kurd. You can't teach that language, uh, which is a, a common ploy by uh, governments and cultures. You never want, uh, you know, a, a minority group or a minority culture to get too strong and be able to keep going because then they remain a threat to you. So one of the ways you can always eliminate threats for minorities in your state is to not allow them to speak their own language, therefore not allow them their cultural traditions to be maintained and continued off in the future. And the Turks aren't the only ones that do this. Everybody does it. Chinese do it. The Russians do it. Everybody has used language as a weapon off and on again, off again. Even small states. Estonia banned Russian language because they didn't want Russians there. So this is a common practice. We're not making fun of the Turks. Um, uh, in 1983 is popping up my head. 83, 84, 85. Uh, uh, the, Kurdish, the Kurdish majority provinces in uh, southeastern Turkey were actually put under complete martial law due to the activities of the PKK. And, and now I'm just going to kind of summarize. You had the, this first wave of, of PKK as it evolved in the early 70s uh, and into the 80s where they actually were fighting each other. So the PKK was kind of started to become violent uh, and they started initially to attack other Kurdish groups who they didn't think were being uh, hardcore enough. So from 78 to 85, you had internal dissent and, that, and the PKK actually blowing up other Kurdish groups and doing terrorist attacks. Uh, and then there was really kind of a full-on guerrilla war in the 1980s and 1990s where you had PKK folks. And again, I'm not making, I'm not making fun of the Turkish, I'm not making fun of the Kurds. Uh, but the PKK was responsible for a whole bunch of stuff blowing up. Uh, so they initially were blowing up their own folks and then they started targeting the Turkish population Turkish civilians, Turkish uh, military. Uh, most attacks were military attacks where they would go blow up uh, uh, Turkish military installations or training camps or Air Force bases, or they would try to. And I believe the, the death toll over the course of a couple decades of this guerrilla-style campaign were somewhere in the 35,000 to 40,000 uh, casualties, mostly civilian. And so you start to put all this together. Is this starting to make sense now? Sorry, I know it's a long podcast, but it's a complicated situation. Are you starting now to get a sense, even deeper sense, of why Turkey is not keen on empowering the Kurds? They, they basically have bad blood between them. Now, let me nice and nice it up for you, because I, I don't want to paint the Turkish government in a really negative light. Yes, the Turkish government has done lots of perhaps bad stuff to the Kurds. Yes, the PKK has done lots of bad stuff in Turkey. And that's where the bad blood comes from. But the PKK, it's, it's labeled as a terrorist group by Turkey. It's labeled as a terrorist group by the United States, by the way. Uh, it's labeled as a terrorist group by most Western nations on planet Earth. So it is a fringe group like any other radical extremist terrorist group, right? But they don't represent all of the Kurds. And that's what most Kurdish people are like, dudes, it ain't us. That's just one real radical fringe. Why are all of us being punished for the work of a radical fringe? I, sorry, I have to put this in here, even though this is long already. Uh, you probably don't remember this because you weren't paying attention to current events several years ago. Uh, maybe more like five years ago. But... The PKK was mostly driven out of Turkey uh, in the late 1990s because Turkey captured its leader. His name is Ocalan, I believe. He's still rotting in a Turkish prison. He'll never be out. When they caught the leader of the PKK, they kind of had a ceasefire, right? 
And, uh, and so things kind of got quiet from about 2000 or kind of up until the modern era, things have been kind of quiet between uh, Turkey and the PKK because the PKK got driven out. But they, they relocated to northern Iraq. Oh, here we go, bringing it on back to current events again. And five years ago, that I know you weren't paying attention to this, but Turkey actually invaded Iraq about five or six years ago. And the United States was like, oh my gosh, please do not do that. Please do not invade northern Iraq. Northern Iraq, Kurdistan, is the only stable part of Iraq right now. Please don't do that. Come on, Turkey, just don't do that. And Turkey said, no, we got to do it. And Turkey uh, flew warplanes over. I think they even sent in some ground troops from Turkey into northern Iraq and blew up some stuff and killed some people. Here's a question. What do you think the Turkish military was blowing up and what people you think they were after in northern Iraq five or six years ago? If you answered the PKK, thumbs up to you. Uh, the PKK is still active and still maybe has a growing membership uh, in and around these areas and all these states. So they may not be in Turkey as much as they were, but they still are in northern Iraq and perhaps other parts of the mountains uh, in this area. And they have started to once again... Uh, uh, have terrorist attacks within Turkey in the last five years. And that's why Turkey said, well, we have to go in and do strategic uh, strikes against this group in northern Iraq. Now, uh, yeah, yeah. if that doesn't help outline why Turkey is very hesitant to go into Kobani, a town literally hundreds of feet away from the Turkish border, and Turkish tanks are sitting there, and Turkish artillery is sitting there, and Turkish troops are sitting there, pointed at this town, watching IS lay siege to this town, but the Turkish military is not doing anything. Does that make more sense now? I hope so. Sorry it took a half an hour to do it, but Turkey is playing the long game. And now I'll get back to what I said about 20 minutes ago. Turkey is looking at this strategically and saying, okay, uh, the IS people, the insane clown Islamic posse, they, we're worried about them. We don't like them. And Turkey is saying, uh, we're looking at Syria, the Syrian civil war, uh, and the Syrian government. We don't like them either. We don't like either of these two groups. We don't want to see any of the people down south of us win. But at the same time, Turkey is looking at the long game here and saying, but we're not going to support and help uh, the Kurds become stronger militarily. Uh, we're not going to give them weapons or training. We don't even want to help them win this town right across our border for fear that that town will then become an enclave and a stronghold for Kurds. And maybe Kurds will end up even controlling parts of northern Syria that's on the border with Turkey that has 15 to 20 million other Kurds in its southeast quadrant who may then over time be compelled to join their brothers in arms in Kobani and in northern Iraq and form a greater Kurdistan, which may pull away part of southeastern Turkey. Bam! Got all that? That's what's going on. Turkey is not timid here. Turkey is not scared of a fight. The Turkish military kicks ass. But they're looking out after their long-term strategic interest and they're questioning whether it's a good idea to empower Kurds any more than the U.S. already is. They're very worried that uh, northern Iraq is going to cede and declare independence, a, a, a fact that, or a, a hypothesis I share. I believe you're going, to, we are soon to see a free, independent uh, Kurdistan in northern Iraq. And the Turks, while no friends of Saddam Hussein or the Iraqi government in particular, are very worried about that because that becomes then a, a center, a base of operations that the Turks will be worried about in perpetuity that they will see might inflame the Kurdish populations in their uh, uh, eastern side of the state. All that makes sense? Turkey ain't, Turkey's not timid. It's a Kurdish conundrum that Turkey's worried about. They want to see IS lose too. They're just not sure they want the Kurds to be the one who beat IS. And the United States, of course, is on the other side saying, we don't care who the hell beats IS. The Kurds are actually good fighters. Again, the Peshmerga, uh, right now, 
today, a hundred Iraqi Kurds called the Peshmerga, their fighting force, kind of like the uh, Kurdish Marines, are being sent in and, Tur and, and they had to fly into Turkey to get across the border into Kobani. And the, Kur the Turks actually had to be convinced to even allow this to happen. For weeks, the Turks have said, no, we're not even going to allow foreign fighters to come in to Turkey to go help the Kurds. They actually finally, behind the scenes, got their arm twisted enough, probably by the United States mostly, but maybe by other NATO allies as well. So this is the big deal. This is what's going on. And that, my friends, is why Turkey is caught in a Kurdish conundrum where they don't want to see this group empowered because they kind of say, well, IS, somebody will eventually beat IS. We just don't want it to be the Kurds. <laughs> that makes sense. Hope so. Got any questions or comments? Hit me up or potential plaidcast for the next go-round. But for now, party on.